Hello everybody and welcome to How to Write Like Hunter S. Thompson Part 2. I am Daniel James. Today we're going to be talking about Hunter Thompson's proverbs and dictums. First, you might be wondering, what is a proverb or dictum, or have I ever heard of one? Obviously, you're familiar with maybe in a biblical sense, but also we have like Chinese proverbs, such as, the best time to plant an oak tree is either today or 50 years ago, or be not afraid of moving slowly, only of standing still. These cute little clever pithy sayings, and that's almost by definition what they are. The definition of a proverb is a short pithy saying in general use, stating a general truth or piece of advice. And Hunter did this in a very unique way, as nearly everything he did in his life. Um, not in sort of maybe a biblical sense or kind of like a life coach sort of way, but he used it to kind of get across much darker um, and yet more real maybe life advice, particularly from the perspective of his really famous character Raul Duke from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which is partly what makes it so interesting. So I have three examples here from Fear and Loathing that we're going to take a look at and we're going to see how a hunter used it the best and why he used it particularly for a first-person narration, why it's such a good good tool there, if, especially if you have a character who's very opinionated and has a lot to say and has all these viewpoints on the world. It's kind of a very good way to get across their ideas or the way they approach the world without sounding pompous or preaching to the reader and demeaning them. So let's jump in here and take a look. No sympathy for the devil. Keep that in mind. Buy the ticket, take the ride. And if it occasionally gets a little heavier than what you had in mind, well... Maybe chalk it off to force consciousness expansion. Tune in, freak out, get beaten. It's all in Kesey's Bible, the far side of reality. So what's going on here? Well, in the real world, in the book, Raul Duke is trying to get his valet ticket, or the valet is trying to give him his parking ticket so he can redeem it later to get his car. It's a really practical, sort of commonplace situation. But when you're off a 10 strip of acid, like Raul Duke is in the, in the book, you have the ability to start relating all of these things to everything else that may or may not be related, right? That's what Aldous Huxley called the funnel of perception. So he's taking this, like the guy's telling him, take the ticket, take the ticket, take the ticket. <laughs> and, in, and in Raul Duke's mind, it's got this big existential connotation, like, you know, be careful what you wish for. Or if you, if you bite it, you better be ready to chew it and swallow it, right? Buy the ticket, take the ride. Like it's in, in some sense, it's almost like advice, right? Buy the ticket. If you want something, go get it. But you better be ready to suffer the consequences. Be careful what you wish for. And so, again, could mean almost anything in any context. But when we're taking it through the lens of this drug-infused mind who's just simply trying to get a valet ticket and ends up really just crushing his world in some sense. If you see in the movie, it's like this really dramatic sort of anxious, anxiety-ridden moment. It's because... It's so effective because from a first-person perspective, you're able to give their beliefs and opinions about the world without it coming across as like pompous or being on a soapbox. It comes across as just simply his thoughts, you know, the way he's perceiving everything and the way he interprets it. Like, this has obviously a much more meaningful connotation than simply taking the valet ticket, especially when we're talking about in the context of drugs. Um, particularly, Terrence McKenna had great advice about this, similar to like Timothy Leary. But he was asked if what what's the dosage you should take, particularly pertaining to mushrooms. And he said, well, I've always thought that if any point throughout the trip you don't wonder if you took too much, you didn't take enough. And so there's a lot of that sort of 60s counterculture sort of advice, obviously, in the book, because Fear and Loathing Las Vegas is considered, uh, was considered like the period to the end of the revolution of the 60s and 70s. Um, he was considered to have ended that with this book. It was in another term, or in another sense, he said it was like the death of the American dream, and maybe the American dream did die in the 60s and 70s with the counterculture revolution. But coming on to the second one here, you've got kill the body and the head will die. Kill the body and the head will die. That's not even written in context in the book. It was something Raul Duke scrawls at the top of his notebook after he comes back to consciousness after this adrenochrome bender. So you could imagine him. He can't remember last night. He blacked out because he was so high. And he's trying to figure out what happened listening to this recording machine and looking in his notebook. And all the first thing that's written is kill the body and the head will die in all capitalizations. Again, a broadly applicable sort of piece of advice that you could give to people in a in a few situations, right? Sort of similar to like a hydra, you know, like if you're talking about a problem, you have a problem or you're, you have a set of problems in your life that's like a hydra. You just keep cutting off one head and three more problems grow up or come out of it, kind of like the Hercules story. And maybe you can't think, grab a boulder to put its head under it, like Hercules did in the myth. But 
maybe the answer then is to stop cutting off heads and to just kill the body, and maybe they'll stop regenerating if the whole thing dies. Um, <laughs> maybe, you know, get to the root of it. What's the root cause? Again, but still, getting that perspective of Raoul Duke when he from the adrenochrome high, you could see where someone might be in this really dark place in their mind where that might seem like really good advice. And then moving on to the third example, one of my favorites, not for me, no mercy for a criminal freak in Las Vegas. This place is like the army. The shark ethic prevails. Eat the wounded. In a closed society where everybody's guilty, the only crime is getting caught. In a world of thieves, the only final sin is stupidity. We all know that, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of truth in this, particularly that last statement, which I love for the kind of the dualistic element of it, the way he subordinates these clauses with the comma, and you can hear it in the pacing. It's genius pacing. It's, it's fun to read. In a closed society where everybody's guilty, the only crime is getting caught. In a world of thieves, the only final sin is stupidity. That's just, that's just beautifully written. But on the other hand, good advice. And that's true. We all know we're all guilty. We've all sent text messages while we're driving. We've all you know, been guilty of speeding. And the advice you always get growing up and you hear parents say it to the kids is, well, don't get caught. Oh, you're going to do something stupid or illegal? Don't get caught. And then the only real shame, everybody's only embarrassed when you do get caught. Yep. It's like, Jesus, you know, it's embarrassing. If you're going to do bad things, you try to get away with it. You know, use your brain, use your head. But when you don't, that's when you get, you get knocked up. But you do the crime, you get, if, what is it saying? Like, if you do the crime, be ready to do the time or something like that. But that's true. Be better than that. If you're going to do bad things, you know, you're going to pay, either get away with it or pay the consequences. And again, maybe not your typical Chinese proverb, like the oak tree saying, but it comes from a darker place. And that's where Raul Duke was operating from. And so I'd recommend anybody in your writing, if you're writing a story from a first person, first person perspective and you're trying to really give this opinionated person who has a lot of things to say without it coming across as disingenuous or preachy this tool of using like proverbs just in their own narration is genius and it comes it comes across so seamlessly you don't even notice it it's so it's so well embedded within the text that it doesn't even stick out as uh, as even advice or a proverb it just seems like them right that they said it or they thought it so until next time guys I'll see you. Peace.